Merry Christmas, one and all. And if you don't celebrate Christmas, happy whatever the hell you celebrate. Despite how much of a tired obligation the whole Christmas thing has become for me in recent years, yes, I am quite the Grinch, there is still a level of sentimentality that comes with the season. It makes most things, no matter how inconsequential, just slightly more special. Like, for me, the Iron Maiden album Senjutsu, and particularly the song The Time Machine, are made even more special to me because they'll forever be associated with Christmas 2021. So hopefully I can spread the cheer and even to just a few people be responsible for the memory that they associate with this, allegedly the most wonderful time of the year before we enter January, or as I like to call it, the Monday of months. So with that, we're going to be doing something a little bit different today. When it comes to Christmas-based video topics or even Christmas-based video games, it's slim pickings. I mean, what even qualifies? And is there even a such thing as a Christmas-based game that's even substantial enough to be worth covering? Usually what you end up having to go with are games with snow in them, because snow equals Christmas, aka the Ross Scott principle, or you end up with tie-in games to Christmas-based media, and I've played a few of those. Two of which I feel are the absolute zenith and the absolute nadir of this topic. The former being the Nightmare Before Christmas game, and the latter being the Polar Express game. Now hold up, I hear you say, isn't the Nightmare Before Christmas a Halloween movie? Well, that's actually an ongoing debate to this day. Some people are in Camp Christmas, with others being in House Halloween. I consider it to be both, but that's why I'm calling this video the very best and very worst ways to make a holiday game and not a Christmas game. Not out of a sense of political correctness, but so I don't have to take a firm stance one way or the other. It's a holiday game. Which holiday, you may ask? Well, that's up to you to decide. The Nightmare Before Christmas Oogie's Revenge has been incorrectly identified to me as a God of War clone, and how do I know it isn't? Well, considering it came out a whole year before God of War, it would be kind of weird if it was. But if you take a look at it for five seconds, you can clearly tell where its influences lie. Yes, this game is extremely similar to Devil May Cry, and that would still be the case even if it weren't literally made and published, in most of the world, by Capcom. This isn't even like when Single Track made Rogue Trip Vacation 2012, because that was at the very least under a different publisher. This is by the exact same developers and publishers as Devil May Cry, and presumably uses at least some version of the same engine, making it more of a reskin than a clone. Although it's not quite at that level, and I kinda wish it was, because Devil May Cry's combat was versatile for a start, where Ogi's Revenge kinda gets fairly stale in that regard usually falling back to only a handful of attacks that don't really string together. So what this game insists is an impressive combo is really just a series of individual attacks done one after another. I get that this game was probably made easier to cater to a really young audience, but being easier doesn't mean you can't also have a variety of attacks. But we get ahead of ourselves. This game is a pseudo-sequel to the movie. Taking place roughly one year after the movie, Jack takes an exodus from Halloween Town and comes back to find that Lock, Shock, and Barrel have revived Oogie. This in turn has caused all sorts of trouble. The holiday doors and several residents of the town have gone missing, and otherwise everything's all topsy-turvy. So it's up to Jack, along with his new weapon, the Soul Robber, courtesy of Dr. Finkelstein, to sort shit out. If you're a fan of the movie, then this will be a treat for you, because it's essentially more of that with gameplay sprinkled in. I'm not personally a fan of the movie, but I do appreciate what this game's trying to do, and I also appreciate that it works the musical elements into the game. What with each boss segment being a musical sequence that also works in rhythm minigames to complement the music. It doesn't transition very well from one to the other, you just collect musical notes until ding, the gameplay stops and you get a rhythm sequence. <laughs> So it feels like the gameplay is made to serve the music and not the other way around, but if you're a fan of the movie, that's probably what you want. It doesn't help the whole game thing, but it's charming. I sure as hell like the soundtrack to the boss fights a lot more than I like the soundtrack to the game generally. Yes, soundtrack, I am well aware that this is Halloween. You don't have to repeat it for every moment of the game. There are other musical pieces that play, but this is Halloween repeats far too often. So yeah, the soundtrack is pretty repetitive, and I'll be honest, the sound design generally is pretty repetitive as well. You will be hearing the same lines over and over. Must I hear Jack yell Soul Robber every time he grabs something? 
Even for the best games, that kind of thing has its limits. But to this game's credit, Oogie's Revenge is pretty decent on the gameplay front. The combat doesn't start too deep, as a matter of fact, it takes a while to reach its stride. As upgrading your weapons doesn't necessarily give you more attacks, just heightened damage. So you'll be doing the same attacks for a while. But instead, you get different costumes, which will give you different modes of attack. The Pumpkin King costume will give you fire-based attacks, and the Santa suit will give you a jack-in-the-box attack that will stun enemies, which is great for defense. You can also buy different types of presents that will have different effects. So you have the ability here to mix and match. I mostly focused my points into the Soul Robber because if you're going to be upgrading something, it might as well be the thing you're using for 80% of the game. So this game is more versatile than it appears at first. Despite only having a small pool of attacks by default, it's a combat engine that feels good to pull off. You'll mostly just be mashing the square button and doing the spin attack, but I do enjoy how it feels. Plus, grabbing an enemy and bashing them into submission is a fun little tidbit that never loses its luster. The variety is a lot more present in the different enemies you fight and how you can fight them. Although as far as variety is concerned, there are some combat controls that are conspicuous by their absence. No block, for example, and no jump button, which is odd. The closest you get is that if you dodge three times in a row, you'll find yourself prancing into the air, which is a strange workaround for something that shouldn't have been there. Though to be fair, I do enjoy how Jack's flamboyant personality and his musical aspects plays into gameplay, and in addition, I do appreciate fundamentally that the brightness of the Soul Robber contrasts lovely against the murky graphics. Not to say this game looks bad for its time, it certainly matches the aesthetic of the movie, which would be exactly what you want if you're a fan of the movie, but they do look slightly repetitive, making navigation a bit of a hassle at times, and the puzzle aspects can be a bit of a hassle as well because of imprecise controls. Navigating tight ledges or obstacle courses can be a bit tough because your exact hitbox is imprecise and your movement is also somewhat imprecise, so the gameplay doesn't really lend itself to platforming whatsoever. Plus, there are some other issues, like the auto-targeting. The auto-targeting will at times target a completely inconsequential enemy when you're wanting to target a slightly more powerful enemy that's actually attacking you. This led to some frustration while I was fighting Lock, Shock, and Barrel, both in their individual boss fights and their triple team boss fight. It also led to some frustration when I was collecting the four bats. It would tell me I was targeting them, tell me I was close enough to grab them, and I just wouldn't grab them. I was genuinely unsure of what I was supposed to do. It wasn't until I looked it up when I found out that I was supposed to grab them, I just wasn't grabbing them well enough. And between segments of gameplay, there were a lot of backtracking, which really killed the pace for me at times. Like, the segment where Clown's unicycle had a rocket booster attached to it so he couldn't stop. So I had to travel all the way across the game world to Dr. Finkelstein's lab to get a tool that could break the rocket booster off, then travel all the way back with very little in between to occupy me. The movement speed isn't great, and even accessing the menus can be a bit of a pain because there's a couple second delay before you can get in and out of the menus. And if you're a couple of sub-menus deep, you can't just exit straight to gameplay. You have to painstakingly back out of every single menu. So yeah, quite frankly, there are a lot of issues I take with this game, but I still did find myself having a pretty fun time. I guess it comes down to this. Despite all the issues, the combat works, and despite being simple, feels good enough that it creates a stimulating core gameplay loop. It's kind of mindless, and it won't blow you away, but it's a solid enough game with plenty of personality. The word for Oogie's Revenge is probably the one word I would use to describe the movie, and that's charming. If you're willing to forgive its shortcomings, it's something that you can't help but smile at while you're playing it. It's not the greatest game of all time, probably a 6.5 or 7 out of 10, but it does create an interesting parallel to another holiday-based game, that being the Polar Express. This was one case where I was surprised there was even a game about it, because it's not really a game sort of movie, if you see what I mean. There's no antagonistic force other than the ever-present threat that they might not make it to the North Pole on time. It's kind of just a wholesome, low-stakes adventure about the spirit of Christmas and the nature of believing, and one with some admittedly cool sequences and impressive CGI for the time that has since fallen a couple of miles down the uncanny valley. The box certainly doesn't give us any indication. Interact with the characters from the movie? Yes, because that's totally how I want to spend my time. Play rhythm games? If that's one of your selling points, this might just be one of the most desperate box blurbs I've ever seen. If you've ever seen the movie, pop quiz, what possible gameplay could you envision coming out of it? If your answer is, I have no earthly clue, then correct, because this is a game that can be most charitably described as a series of desperately shoehorned distractions to pad out the pitifully short runtime. 
The game starts out as something that could theoretically work, because it sort of feels like the PS1 Harry Potter games, except instead of navigating an open-ended castle and using spells, you navigate an extremely linear series of train cars to do whatever desperately contrived bit of gameplay is in that train car. Sometimes you might need to do some extremely basic combat or platforming, or even stealth. But most of the time you'll do disconnected minigames, like a best of five tennis match. What? Or you might need to help navigate your companion down an icy train. You might need to catch mice, break ice, and so on. And what with the setting being a train for most of the game, the level design is extremely cramped and limited. And as far as the antagonist that they chose, they ended up going with the Ebenezer Scrooge puppet that briefly shows up in the movie that gave us all nightmares as kids. Trouble being that this was not an actual antagonist, it was just a marionette piloted by one of the characters. But they saw that and thought, okay, good enough, we'll use that character as a sort of pseudo-antagonist so we can get the toys to come to life and maybe get some sort of gameplay out of this. Leading to a really weird out-of-place boss fight halfway through the game with giant puppet Ebenezer Scrooge where we have to throw snowballs at his open chest cavity. Something about this is so surreal. And it's funny, Tom Hanks' character walks into the destroyed train car after the boss fight, and I'm sure he had a lot of questions for the kids after that. This really does feel like a game that was a result of a 12-hour brainstorming meeting where they mostly drew a blank on how to get any blood from this stone, as anyone would. And the funny thing is, this is the quote-unquote good part of the game. The later stages of the game is just dreadful minigame after dreadful minigame, where each one is worse than the last. Dodging obstacles on top of the train followed by a dreadful skiing minigame, rhythm sections that go on for too long, and one particular navigation section in these tubes where you have to match up the correct sequence of colors and time to move on, which takes all of 7 minutes and made me nearly throw up by the end. There are a few puzzle platforming sequences in what can charitably be described as the core gameplay style, but it's either too simple or in the case of the final of these stages, hard to navigate because of the incredibly repetitive backgrounds. And it all comes to an incredibly sudden ending where they don't even feel like showing players the conclusion to the movie as if the developers wanted to get out of this as quickly as possible. And quickly as possible really is the operative phrase here considering this game clocks in at less than two hours. Holy crap. I don't think I've ever seen a more desperate excuse for a video game. It truly is the quintessential example of a cynical cash grab made for no other reason than to squeeze money out of a relevant property. Not something that exists for any artistic reasons, but because some dick needed to be paid. I know I've said desperate multiple times, but it really is the operative phrase here. It's the most desperate game I think I've ever played. They had no idea what to do with this game, and it shows. These two games kind of represent the complete opposite ends of the spectrum for me in a great many ways. They're both tie-ins to different holiday-based intellectual property, but one succeeds at what it sets out to do where the other completely falls flat, to put it mildly. And when looking at them side by side, you'd think that both would be of similar quality given the fact that they were both made for essentially the same reason, to tie into successful franchises. The major difference I think between these games are how they tied into the things they were tying into. The Polar Express was a cynical, probably quickly whipped up cash grab trying to lure in kids who liked the movie. Kids that really didn't know to critically examine how a game based off this movie could have possibly turned out. It came out relatively concurrently with the Polar Express movie and as such was attempting to mooch off whatever success it could. It was a tie-in game in the absolute worst way. Whereas the Nightmare Before Christmas game came out in 2004, over a decade after the movie that it's tying into. So at the very least, the Nightmare Before Christmas game had no theoretical time limit. Of course they wanted it out for Christmas season, but they could use the movie as a jumping off point, but not be forced into a tiny release window. And because it came out so much later than the movie, you can tell that this was more of a labor of love for the movie, rather than something that was attempting to cash in on something's relevance. As such, they can polish it up and make it their own. It's not perfect, but it feels infinitely less cynical because of this. Historically, tying games to various intellectual property that came out well after the fact tended to be better than games where the deadline is specifically made to be alongside the thing it's tying into. It's very similar to things like GoldenEye on N64 or The Warriors on PS2 and Xbox, the former coming out well over a year after the movie it's tying into, and the latter coming out something like 30 years after the fact. Despite the fact that GoldenEye hasn't aged the best, it was a great game for its time because they took their time and let the concept blossom rather than forcing it out. Plus, The Nightmare Before Christmas is a concept that can actually work as a game because the setting lends itself to the gameplay it has. Was Oogie's Revenge a cynically made game specifically to make money off a well-known IP? Probably, but it doesn't come across when you're playing. 
Making a game out of the Polar Express would be like making a game out of Schindler's List. There's just nothing there. Nothing to grasp onto. So the end result is inherently forced. Many of the few great tie-in games that exist are usually good because they take a unique aspect of the thing they're tying into and create gameplay out of it. Like the tie-in game for Spider-Man 2. That's a great-ass game that holds up to this day, simply due to the fact that it's using the unique aspects of Spider-Man as a character in order to create a meaningful gameplay loop. Plus, I think Capcom realized that they could probably adapt the Nightmare Before Christmas setting more than they could adapt the movie itself. So they chose to make an entirely original story out of it, where the Polar Express tried to adapt the movie pretty much shot for shot. When you take an IP and create your own story out of it, you can allow yourself more room to create something worthwhile, whereas doing a one-to-one -one adaption of any movie, especially this one, is inherently difficult because you're basically having to fit gameplay into an existing sequence of events that may or may not lend itself to that. Another one of the generally considered great movie adaptation games was the Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay, which took the Chronicles of Riddick setting and made an entirely original story out of it. There are multiple ways that tie-in games can work. Philosophies that are taken on board by the Nightmare Before Christmas game, but not taken on board by the Polar Express game. There's no inherent quality that a game or movie will have, regardless of the circumstances surrounding the creation of it. You just have to be creative enough to subvert your limitations. There's always going to be stumbling blocks that make certain things more difficult to be good than others. Sometimes a piece of media is just a bad idea from the start, and that's true with the Polar Express game. But maybe if they took any of these philosophies on board, it could have actually been something worthwhile instead of just a work-for-hire piece of crap. It's things like this that make me glad that cheap tie-in games are by and large a thing of the past, because so many of them existed just to fill space and squeeze money out of various properties. These days, making a full AAA product is too expensive to make cheap tie-in games anymore outside of things like Android or iOS. And those pieces of crap can stay over there as far as I'm concerned. I haven't played an iOS game since I was a teenager. I believe in the artistic merit of games, and things like the Polar Express game are examples of the lack of artistry in tie-in games, things that exist purely to be product, but these days, the odd tie-in game that comes out at least has an attempt at artistic merit, and there are usually standalone products that attempt to tell their own stories within a grander universe. Not to say they're perfect, or even necessarily good, but a lot of games these days that attempt to tie into a larger universe are at least on an equal playing field to the rest of the gaming landscape. And that's the video. You can feel free to turn off the video now if you want. I'm just gonna take a minute to say some things, since this video is the last video of the year. I just wanted to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you to everyone who stuck around. The support that you've all shown me over the past year has been astronomical. On Christmas Day of 2021, I had roughly 1,600 subscribers, and at time of writing, I've just surpassed 57,000 subscribers. This whole thing is something I never even considered possible. You know, I'm only considered moderately sized at this point, but it's still something that's changed my life. And as long as you people support me, I'm more than happy to make the content you want me to make whether you've been here since pre-1000 or post-50,000 from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. It's been a rough year, to be honest. I mean, I spent a whole week in Philadelphia. That's a fate worse than death. YouTube certainly hasn't made it easy for me, what with all the videos being flagged for adult content or whatever. It certainly feels like I'm swimming upstream, but as long as you guys are watching, I'm more than happy to produce. Now, I also wanted to get some more specific thank yous out of the way. First of all, thank you to my patrons who have supported me over the past year, even the ones who backed out. The fact that you were able to support me at all is extremely appreciated. Of course, my $10 patrons deserve a special thanks for going above and beyond, Farmcat84, Inutsu, and GAW004. Then I also wanted to thank some people who have helped me along the way. I want to thank all my friends and colleagues, and a special thank you to Ryrule for vetting some of my scripts, as well as appearing in my videos whenever I asked. He was more or less my God of War guru who kept me on track during those videos. That guy always goes above and beyond. Go subscribe to him. And also a big thank you to Jay's Reviews, who also helped me with some scripts along the way. And thank you to my friends and family who have supported me along this journey. You guys are probably sick of hearing about this at this point. 2023 may be the year where we continue to get the ball rolling, or it may be the year everything goes up in smoke. Either way, I'm happy to go along for the ride. And I will see you in 2023.